Another quick sound check. Uh, we're five minutes from the hour. All righty, we have hit uh, 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, that 
maybe a lot of different times in um, uh, the world for uh, the people here tonight. For me, it's 11 p.m. Uh, so I'm uh, um, hopefully going to uh, match the energy that I had uh, 12 hours ago um, and uh, give you a lively and non-threatening uh, chemistry seminar. So thank you all for coming this morning. Um, morning, <laughs> it's not even morning for me and uh, for many of you it's not morning, but um, for me it's always morning, I suppose. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, folks who uh, came to the uh, first time I presented this um, and uh, have have come back for it again. Um, I haven't made many, many changes. I had, I had planned to do a lot more updating, um, but in the last two weeks, uh, we went from uh, in-person classes to online classes and back again. Um, with like oh only a couple of days notice for each transition, so it's 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 kind of been a um, roller coaster here. So um, anyway, um, let's get on with the show here. Uh, let me uh, delete my uh, warning here. May contain chemistry and cats and uh, drawings. I've drawn myself. Uh, let's see more. Rid of that guy, um, and oops, there we go. Okay, um, I always have to take a moment to figure out the the um, um, the, the screen. So. When the Nobel Prize was announced in uh, last fall, I thought it would be a, a good opportunity to talk a bit to this group about um, some organic chemistry, some of the basics of organic chemistry. Uh, I'm going to mention several Nobel Prizes uh, that have contributed to like uh, the current one. So, um, you know, basically I'm going to um, uh, talk to you about some of the basics of organic chemistry. I'm going to talk to you a lot about some of the jargon and what it means, uh, because um, you know the, the the field is just full of uh, jargon. So, um, we go. That works. Okay. So the 2021 uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Benjamin List and David McMillan. Um, listed uh, some, some some reactions. I'm going to focus on Macmillan's work, uh, which was an actual Diels-Alder uh, reaction. And the Nobel Prize was given for, quote, the development of asymmetric um, organocatalysis. Uh, let's see, and if I can copy that and put it in the local chat, then you can actually see this. I have given the um, PDF of this talk to uh, Jess. It's in your uh, Science Circle email, Jess. Uh, so uh, this will be uh, posted as, as well. Um, asymmetric organocatalysis. It sounds like English, but is it really? No, it's, it's more organic chemistries. So, so let's um, dissect these words and uh, figure out what they actually mean. Uh, next slide. Here we go. So uh, this comes from um, uh, Chemistry and Engineering News, uh, um, and it, it's a um, picture of the reaction that uh, was cited in the Nobel Prize. This is from Macmillan's work. So it's it's this stuff and this stuff in the presence of this stuff, and you get these two things. Uh, thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. No, 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 I need to explain a lot more than that. Um, so yeah, uh, how does this work? Well, the uh, um, key part on this chemical is where the pointer is. There's a double bond there. Then there's a double bond, single bond, double bond. And these two key parts get together to form a ring. And we end up getting this structure here. 
That's the basic Diels-Alder reaction, okay? Uh, and there are some details, details that we need to uh, know about here, okay? So um, what are these details? All right. Well, the Diels-Alder reaction was discovered, uh, and discovery only has one S. I should have caught that before, but um, it was discovered in 1928 by two guys, Otto Diels and Kurt Alder. Some of my uh, students make the mistake of thinking it's Dr. Diels-Alder, just one guy, but it is two guys. Um, they got the Nobel Prize for this in 1950, and it forms six-membered rings. Six-membered rings. Why are those important? the previous slide um there's a carbon there's a carbon i'll explain this a little more that's two there's one there's another one there's another one there's another one that's four so two plus four is six and they end up one two three four five six so this reaction makes two carbon carbon bonds that's actually pretty special it makes two carbon-carbon bonds at the same time. Um, oops, next. It, uh, there's some more jargon. It does so with a preferred direction for how the bonds are made. That's uh, regiospecificity, or regio specifically. And if there's um, a handedness, like left-handedness or right-handedness, just that physical property of not being superimposable on your mirror image. Um, if it's got a handedness, then um, these reactions prefer just one single handedness to the prod product. Okay. Caveats there is that you have to actually start with a single handedness of the starting materials, if, if that's a physically possible thing. Okay, so, this is all about geometry, figuring out how to um, make new carbon-carbon bonds, which has been a, a huge problem in organic chemistry. Uh, most of the 20th century uh, was spent figuring out reactions that would make you new carbon-carbon bonds and have those bonds point in the directions that you really need them to, right? Um, one of the beautiful things about this Diels-Alder reaction is that uh, once quantum theory came into uh, existence uh, and uh, we figured out how to do some um, quantum mechanical calculations on um, the, these compounds, um, these reactions are completely explainable and um, you can make predictions about structure. Right. So this this ends up being a uh, topic that is covered in detail in organic uh, chemistry classes. So, um, you know, it's part of a larger class of reactions called pericyclic reactions. But I'm just going to focus on this uh, one type of reaction that takes like a double bond and then two adjacent double bonds and makes a six member ring. The Diels-Alder guy. So, yay. Next. So. Um, Asymmetric catalysis, that was in the Nobel Prize blurb, the quote I read. Uh, why is it important? Well, here's, here's an example. So um, you may remember um, the movie Awakenings with uh, Robin Williams. Um, and that was based on um, uh, the experiences of uh, Oliver Sacks. Uh, Awakenings was about um, um, patients um, that um, had um, extreme Parkinsonianism and uh, giving them L-DOPA allowed uh, for them to come out of uh, their catatonia and uh, re-engage with uh, the world. Uh, sadly, it uh, was not a permanent uh, fix uh, because you needed more and more L-DOPA to get to the same place and then there are side effects. Um, but L-DOPA is an important um, drug. Its synthesis uh, was first made uh, possible um, was first made possible in, I believe, the 70s. Um, 
60s and 70s. Um, and, you know, basically there was a catalyst involved. There is a, um, there is a uh, rhodium um, catalyst involved. I won't go into the details of this reaction. It's, it's really, really wonderful. But here's the thing. You have a double bond there, and you add a hydrogen to this carbon and a hydrogen to that carbon. And you get this molecule. Right? Nothing else has changed. You just added a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. But the thing is, look at this carbon. There are four different things attached to that carbon. There's a hydrogen, which isn't drawn. That's, that's, that's a thing in these structures. Um, and then there's like that carbon, which has something attached to it. This carbon, which has something different attached to it. And that NH2. Um, a carbon with four different things attached is uh, going to have this property of left-handedness or right-handedness. Um, it won't be superimposable on its mirror image. So, uh, let's see, I think that is the... Uh, well, uh, duh, it's L-DOPA, so that is the left-handed version of it. Uh, so, um, the other uh, handedness, um, I don't know if it's actually biochemically active. Uh, that would be the best case scenario. If it were biochemically active, it might even be poisonous. So, um, you know, basically it is really important to have the handedness right. Okay, so the uh, 2001 Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, this type of work. And uh, rhodium catalysis, pal palladium catalysis, um, that um, gives you um, this handedness to uh, molecules in really, 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 really high purities, uh, that, has been, that has been a, a huge area of, of development in chemistry. Um, But here's the thing. Do you want traces of heavy metals like rhodium or palladium in your pharmaceuticals? Right? Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. So uh, here's an example. L-DOPA has hand in this. I got ahead of, it, ahead of myself. It's a better uh, picture of it. You can actually see the hydrogen there. Uh, and you can see that if you go from nitrogen to this group to that group, you're going in a counterclockwise um, direction. If you swapped the nitrogen and that group, then you'd go in a clockwise um, direction. There, and the two um, forms uh, just aren't the same. Uh, they wouldn't interact the same biochemically. Um, and that's because most of the biochemicals in you have a handedness too. And just as uh, you know, it's easy for one person to shake the right hand of another person with their own right hand, it's it's harder for someone to shake someone's left hand. Right? They the hands just don't go together. Let's see. Um, Shiloh's question: handedness. Um, um, that, well, here's the thing. The um, L-DOPA, the handedness there is what the uh, dopamine receptors will accept. Um, the opposite handedness um, may just be ignored by the receptors or may just be toxic. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you have the wrong handedness in the wrong place, it might get stuck uh, and uh, kill the receptor. I think there's some examples of that known. All right. Let's go on with the next slide. So, yeah, basically no one wants traces of heavy metals in their pharmaceuticals. Uh, heavy metals, bad. Uh, traces of heavy metals, uh, you know, in one dose might not be a problem, but if it's a thing that you have to take for the rest of your life, then that is a, um, is a problem, right? So yeah, um, you know, L-DOPA, the other DOPA um, is probably inert, I don't know, but uh, for the general case, 
where you have uh, molecules that have handedness that are important for um, pharmaceutical things, you want to make sure the handedness is, is correct. Thalidomide, uh, for example, um, turns out um, thalidomide was a um, pharmaceutical um, that was uh, given to uh, pregnant women in Canada. The U.S. never uh, uh, approved it. Um, and it was, um, I think it's a uh, relaxant, but it caused severe birth defects, um, the, uh, you know, basically um, deformed limbs. So There's a whole generation of people uh, just, just my age who, um, you know, have, um, have deformed limbs because of this. And it ended up that, um, it ended up that uh, one form was talk. Well, one form was mutagenic, and the other form was not. It wouldn't have mattered if they had given just the uh, form that was, um, um, uh, you know, um, j just the um, um, relaxant, uh, because it turns out in the body um, the two forms actually interconvert. So, so yeah, um, the left-handedness and the right-handedness is a, is a really important um, thing. So, uh, looking at Macmillan's work again, let's dissect the jargon in this picture, uh, starting with um, like how this bonding, how how the carbons and stuff are all held together in the organic molecule. Um, so I'm going to start with Lewis dot structures. Excuse my um, drawing program. It's Mike draw, very very quaint. <laughs> um, I I do like having a mixture of, uh, um, of of technologies from 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 drawing to um, you know the 3D models. I'll show you later. Uh, let's start with just thinking about the periodic table. Uh, we've got elements uh, in in the first row of the periodic table. We've got hydrogen and helium. Um, Notice how I've drawn a little number above, excuse me, the symbol for each element. Um, that number is the number of protons in the nucleus. And a uh, periodic table is uh, essentially broken down into rows, and I'll tell you why. Um, and, um, you know, the rows uh, start at the left, they go to the right, and um, elements are, um, you know, in the sequence of how many protons they've got in a nucleus. So hydrogen has one proton. Um, a neutral hydrogen, since protons have a positive charge, a neutral hydrogen atom will have one electron associated with it. Um, helium has two protons in its nucleus, and a neutral helium atom will have two electrons associated with it. And then, for some reason, we decide to start a new row. Okay, I'll tell you about that. Um, so, Lewis dot structures basically look at uh, the outermost electrons, the um, electrons that actually do chemistry. So, while lithium has three electrons associated with it, Two of them are in this first shell, and they're associated so tightly with the nucleus that, mm, yeah, you're, you're never going to get them to participate in any chemistry. So that means that only one electron on lithium is actually left over to do any chemistry with. And that's why lithium sits under hydrogen, because hydrogen just has one electron in its outermost shell that um, sees the world. Okay. We look at lithium, element three, element four is beryllium, five is boron, element six is carbon. And while carbon does have six electrons, again, two of them are in that first shell. They don't do anything. They don't associate with the outside world. They're too far down, close to the nucleus, held too tightly for uh, any chemistry to happen. So that's why in a Lewis structure of just a carbon atom, we have the element symbol surrounded by four little dots, and each dot represents a carbon, right? Same as for the hydrogen. Hydrogen just um, has one dot. And what we can do is put these structures together so as to satisfy the electronic requirements, that's the jargon, um, of um, each, each atom. It turns out 
uh, that each of these atoms is going to strive to get to eight electrons uh, to fill the shell. There's enough room in the second shell for eight electrons. How does it do that? Well, by sharing. So one hydrogen can share its electron with a carbon. That means this hydrogen sharing a pair of electrons with a carbon uh, essentially means that um, has a bond, but it has access to both of those electrons. So it's electronically satisfied. Carbon's going to need uh, some more friends. So there's more hydrogens invited to this party. So um, um, with four hydrogens, carbon can now um, have access to eight electrons. And that's a magic number. It makes um, uh, carbon um, carbon's uh, electronic uh, requirements be, be satisfied. It's basically all the space it's got around it is actually filled with something. Um, pairs of electrons are usually just represented by lines if they're a bond, right? So um, what I've drawn here, the CH4 is uh, just methane. Okay. There we go. Uh, so you know, basically, if I'm going to teach my um, teach my classes, uh, show how how to make these Lewis structures, there's a little procedure. I'll run through that real quick. Um, these are my cats. The little ones have grown a lot bigger. Um, that guy is eight years old. This one is uh, three years old. She's 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 quite large. She hasn't grown anymore. Um, and in fact, they're running around in the basement with me, and I'm trying to make sure that no one uh, just kind of dive bombs the keyboard. So, anyway, if uh, if I'm if we're trying to figure out how to make a um, how to make a molecule just like predicted from a um, formula, for example, CH2O, um, that that would be formaldehyde. Um, what we would do is count how many electrons there are. Um, carbon has four. It's um, four from the left of the periodic table. Um, so basically um, give it four electrons. Two hydrogens, each has one. So that's two times one. Oxygen, uh, if you look at it, um, six from the left of the periodic table, six electrons. You add all of those up, you get 12. Okay, you got 12 electrons to work with. Um, well, you're going to use pairs of electrons to hold the atoms together. So let's attach the hydrogens and the oxygen to the carbon. And so one, two, three bonds, three bonds. <laughs> That's six electrons because there's two electrons per uh, line. So 12 that we had at the beginning minus six leaves you six and you have to do something with them. Uh, turns out that atoms attract electrons more strongly as you go towards the right-hand side of the periodic table. So we're just going to give all those electrons to the oxygen. So the oxygen can have its eight electrons, or at least access to eight electrons. And, you know, we don't have any left. And that's sad because the carbon only has access to six electrons, and it is very unhappy about this. Uh, and essentially uh, forces the oxygen to share one of those pairs of electrons. And we get this thing called a double bond. Okay. Um, and with the double bond, the carbon now has access to um, eight electrons, a magic number. Next. Uh, another piece of jargon are these stick diagrams. I've actually shown you some stick diagrams um, before, but let's let's formally talk about this. Um, th this would be a molecule called butadiene. This is one called ethylene. And um, these guys are the simplest molecules that can do the Diels-Alder reaction. So you got your double bond, you got a single bond, you got your double bond in one molecule. And you got your double bond in the other molecule. And I've drawn each carbon with four bonds, right? Double bond counts as four electrons. Uh, CHs each count for two electrons. So each carbon has four electrons. Um, in our line notation, which I've given down here, we 
um, represent each vertex as a carbon atom. All right, so there's four uh, carbon atoms right there. Uh, we show the double bonds between the carbon atoms, the single bonds and the double bonds, but we don't show hydrogens. It is assumed that, uh, you know, if a vertex doesn't have four lines, the ones that aren't drawn uh, go to hydrogens. Okay, so this uh, st structure means the same as this. This structure, the ethylene, CH2, double bond, CH2, means the same as this guy. Okay, so, um, you know, it takes a little bit of practice uh, in an organic chemistry course to um, get to this point where, you know, it becomes second nature. But with practice, it, it does. Uh, you know, people get there. Let's see. Next. Um, so one of the nice things about these organic stick reactions, it makes it a little bit easier for us to draw reactions. What I've drawn with the red lines here is arrows, and these arrows represent uh, movements of electrons. So double bonds actually are very electron rich because there's four electrons involved. Um, and one of these, um, one of these um, pairs of electrons can go to connect that carbon atom to that carbon atom. So I've shown where the electrons come from by the tail end of the arrow, and the head of the arrow shows where they go. Same thing as this guy. This pair of electrons can go over here. This pair of electrons can go over there to join this carbon atom to that one. And then we get um, the new bonds showing up uh, in red uh, and our six-membered ring. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is one of the hardest parts of the organic chemistry in the second year, um, is, uh, getting people to be careful of where the arrows start and where they end. Uh, the, um, organic chemists are real strict about that. And rightly so, because this is a means of communication. It is a way of telling other people that, you know, how a reaction happens. So um, this upper one is just a Diels-Alder reaction. This lower one, I've taken benzene, which is a six-membered ring. It's got three double bonds in it. Um, it alternates double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond. And uh, the thing is that these double bonds can uh, move or can be represented as moving. They don't actually move. Um, and, you know... I can have a double bond here, or I can have a double bond there. Um, I've drawn what's called the two Kekulé structures, after Kekulé um, basically first proposed these. Um, and it introduces another piece of jargon. It's called resonance. Um, in benzene, these bonds don't actually move about. The true structure is... Um, an average of these guys. Turns out this Lewis structures, these line structures, they are um, so useful that, um, you know, we make them do things sometimes that they're not really designed to do. Um, you know, the lines that connect the atoms they re they they imply that the electrons stay between those two atoms and are just connecting two atoms. That's that's not really how electrons work. It's not really how bonding works. There is delocalization to bonding. So this idea of resonance, where the uh, bonds are a little bit more mobile, and we say, okay, well, the true structure is a hybrid of several structures. That is a patch on the theory of uh, Lewis, Lewis structures. Next. So I mentioned this eight electrons thing. Well, um, Eight electrons, electrons are particles and waves at the same time. It's a quantum thing. Um, so um, if they're particles and waves at the same time, then the wave-like properties of um, electrons uh, can tell you something about 
uh, where the electrons can be found. Um, the uh, think of vibrations on a string. Um, the basic vibration on the string might have a um, like a single up and a down. You might have a harmonic that has a node in the middle, and while the left half is up, the right half would be down, and vice versa, right? Um, the three D structure of where the electrons are allowed to go are very uh, similar to how vibrations on a piece of string might be. So um, the lowest energy, the lowest, um, yeah, you know, the lowest energy, the one that is most close to the nucleus just has um just looks like a sphere and in fact if i stand up let me stand up stand up and there we go um i've got my orbital reser here um this is yay sometime that'll show up that is a uh um hydrogen um, 1s orbital. That's where a hydrogen might stash its electron. Okay? These, uh, rep these do uh, temporary um, structures. Carbon has a um, carbon has that and it's close to the nucleus, but it's got another one that's in its second shell. And the second shell is bigger. Okay? Because it has to be bigger, because the um, electrons are a bit further away. So um, electrons that uh, do uh, some bonding with other atoms, and they happen to be the spherical type of electron, um, would be something that looks like that. Let's see. The thing is, each shell. So that hydrogen has just the one shell. Um, carbon has two shells. It's got the interior shell, which is the same as hydrogens. And then it's got um, the next shell, second shell, which has something that looks like the hydrogen thing, but bigger. And then it has its own other set of um, orbitals. Um, calling them orbitals, yay. Um, these guys are harmonics. They're like the uh, vibration on the string that is the second order harmonic. Uh, here's an example. Uh, let's do that. So think of it as a sphere that's essentially been cut in half, right? And the different colors represent phases so that like the red maybe have a positive phase if you were to graph this on a piece of graph paper or something. The blue might have a negative phase. The phase itself has no physical meaning uh, that it's not going to translate into anything macroscopic. If you, um, this, you know, if one side is positive, the other side is negative, what translates to a macroscopic property is the square. Um, so, you know, if the one side is negative and you square it, then it becomes positive. And the macroscopic property is uh, the probability of finding the electron. So um, this is the shape of where the electron can be. The colors, the phases, they are kind of important in terms of bonding, in terms of being able to put um, the electrons um, so that they can connect different atoms to each other. So let's go back here again. Yeah. So this is a bit of math, and I'm going to try not to scare you here. So there's here's a picture of uh, cats soothing each other um, <laughs> as I talk to them about orbitals, which I do sometimes. Um, what we can do on an atom is combine these orbitals. We can uh, basically say, okay, let's take that spherical one, let's take those dumb, two of those dumbbell looking ones and mix them up. And well, if you take a spherical one, let me raise one. 
if we take a dumbbell one, we pass on. Oops. Okay. Well, there's a dumbbell inside the uh, blue sphere. Um, think of the blue areas adding together and inflating. And where the blue and red intersect, they cancel each other out. Okay. So that will end up giving us one lobe that's big and one lobe that's small. So like what I've drawn here with a blue big lobe and then kind of a little nubby um, blue lobe on the other side, right? Uh, the red represents a different one and the green represents a different one. These things basically are uh, just going to be where your single bonds and organic molecules are made. Hmm, I said there were three of the dumbbell looking ones. An X, one along the X axis, one along the Y axis, one along the Z axis, right? Uh, we've left the one along the Z axis alone. So we just have its normal dumbbell thing. This is important. This is what gives us our double bonds because we get sideways overlap of these um, dumbbell looking things that give us um, give us where uh, these double bonds can be. Okay, If you want to do it mathy, you can say that I'm going to take the math for this orbital, I'm going to take the math for that orbital. I'm either going to add them together or subtract them from one another. Other, in other words, I'm going to make an interference pattern, one where they combine and one where they uh, destroy each other. And on the next slide, I can show you where, what that looks like a little bit. So, um, you know, if you have the dumbbell on one atom, dumbbell on another atom, you bring the atoms close together, you're going to get a combination of those that's down here where the um, atoms or where, where, where the electrons actually uh, pull the nuclei closer together. That would be a stabilizing force, so the energy goes down. Y axis on this little graph is energy. Um, the um, destructive interference um, version of this, where they subtract from one another, makes the energy goes up. And that uh, shape corresponds uh, to this um, orbital. I think I've got, I actually did um, some low-level calculations on um, these molecules. And then imported the results into second life. So here you go, okay. And what I'm uh, pointing at right now, oops, I'm moving my pointer. There you go. Okay, so the thing that my pointer is pointing at right now is uh, just, just ethylene, it's just this CH2, double bond CH2. The um, upper, the upper um, thing with the um, four lobes on it corresponds to um, corresponds to a um, oh a molecular orbital it's got no electrons in where the double bond actually has electrons that form the double bond are actually there okay so at this point it kind of introduced that we've got um, places where electrons can go, and we can have uh, some of these places occupied with electrons, and then others, like this one up here, can be empty. Okay. Let's see. Next. Okay, so let me move move stuff back just back back 
if you only consider what the P orbitals are doing, the dumbbell looking things are doing, you can actually, it's all back of the envelope uh, calculation at the very, very lowest level of um, quantum theory, and basically kind of um, figure out what um, they're going to look like by considering what the individual ones are going to do. So in butadiene, which is one of the ingredients of a diels alder reaction, you've got four carbons, each with one of these dumbbells. The lowest energy one is going to be where the dumbbells have all the signs aligned the same. The next one up, oh, you've got two the same, and then there's a flip, and then two the same. Next one up, there's two places where the signs flip, and then the next one up, there's three places. The more flips, the higher the energy. Um, and in this picture, what we've got, and it's, let me bring the 3D models out again, trying not to scare you by, uh, you know, getting them like right in your face. And, I've got the model of the molecule right in front of them as well. So that's a butadiene um, right there. And um, I calculated the energies of these guys. Uh, you can see them um, as the labels. Um, butadiene has um, four electrons in these dumbbell looking things. So each of these orbitals cannot, can, can, um, Hold two electrons. So we got two down there, oops, two down there, two in there, and then the top two are empty. We're almost to where the Diels Alder reaction actually occurs. Um, considering, considering, um, the shadings on how these, um, orbitals look, um, Woodward and Hoffman came up for, with a series of rules, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, dwell on them, because, uh, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to spend too, too much time on that. Um, we have to watch the energies, uh, that's, that's Marty, she's one of my kitties, she's the big one. Um, and uh, sometimes she's very low energy, so she would be one of the uh, uh, lower but occupied orbitals. So, to make these reactions work, what you have to do is take um, electrons and figure out where they can go. So that means something like uh, taking a highest occupied molecular orbital, which is um, on butadiene where my red uh, 3D arrow is pointing to, and figuring out where on the ethylene, which one of these orbitals on the ethylene, um, it can overlap with, or it can match with. Can't really match with that one because uh, the shadings don't line up very well. In here, this one, okay, it can't, for on ethylene, it can't do the lower one. It can do the upper one, though. Um, for the upper one, um, the low bond, the left, and the low bond, the right, in the back of the, in the back, where, of the, what I'm pointing to, can overlap with um, those those lobes. The colors line up. Okay. If I pop this in the back again. Okay. 
Now, essentially, the colors line up with the different sides of the molecule. Um, and that is where the bond formation starts, because there's electrons up in one of these orbitals and emptiness in the other one, but electrons are allowed to go if they get close enough. And there's a nicer um, picture of it uh, from, from Wikipedia. You can see um, whatever sign of orbital that um, clear space corresponds to, they match up, as do the uh, shaded spaces. Okay? Normally, you would get, uh, let's see, normally you would get the um, diene, which has two double bonds in it, um, yielding its electron over to um, the, like, ethylene, I'm calling it. Dienophile is another um, bit of jargon that we don't really need to worry about. But it would go into the unoccupied orbit. And basically, you get the bond formation starting. Uh, it is possible for uh, it to go the other way. Uh, just depends on where you have electron richness and where you have um, electron poor regions. So, uh, let me show you one, one last slide. This guy. I've drawn the product. over here. Oops. There we go. I've drawn the product. There's my perfectionism kicking in. I need the arrow to point where I want it to point. There we go. Um, so, you know, essentially we started with um, uh, two double bonds on the butadiene, one double bond to the ethylene, and we ended up making two new carbon-carbon bonds, and there's one double bond still still remaining. And if you look at the if you look at the uh, lobes, if you look at the lobes on that double bond, you can see that's a double bond. It should look a lot like what the ethylene does, but there's some participation from neighboring atoms, right? It's not just exactly the same as the um, ethylene, the structure in the middle. Um, I'm only mentioning this because uh, this helps to show that electrons aren't as localized as the Lewis structures might suggest. They do roam around a little bit. They can um, show you know, a little bit more mobility than you would expect. Okay. Uh, especially in that that upper one, um, those those electrons are kind of all over that molecule, right? Uh, it's uh, lowest unoccupied, but if you put an electron in there, that electron would um, have considerable mobility. Okay, so let's pop this back. Yeah, so I used um, I used a program called Games G A M E S S. Uh, that uh, comes out of, I think, University of Norfolk in the UK. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to check that. It is um, um, been made freely available. Uh, you know, one just has to register for a license and uh, for academic use that is, um, you know, or for non-commercial use that is, that is free. Um, Another um, calculation program is called ORCA, and uh, that's out of the Max Planck Institute. They give very, very similar results. Uh, so I did the calculations of all of those molecules at fairly low levels, and then was able to import the calculation results into Second Life. Um, let's see. Next one. Okay, so the you know, Woodward Hoffman rules, um, the thing I love about it is that there's a mnemonic. Um, George Scott endures Antarctic conditions, and that's, that's timely. Um, it's been um, 
it's been cold here. Uh, sorry, I'm in the U.S. Uh, we, we've been seeing temperatures about eight Fahrenheit or freedom height, as uh, I've seen some people call it. And yeah, I think it's like minus 10 Celsius, it's minus infant Celsius. But the G, S, E, A, C, those actually have chemical meanings. Um, uh, ground state, even, that's the number of pairs of electrons even number pair of electrons, and Tara would be a um, and Tara facial. I'm going to show you slides on this anyway. It's going it, to it, it's a way of um, defining how the molecules uh, get together to form bonds. Um, so the geometry is what you want, and the uh, condition is either conrotatory, disrotatory. I've got slides on that. It becomes easy. Let's see, um, Diels-Alder reactions uh, don't really occur in biofuels, no. Uh, they may occur when you burn biofuels just as a very minor, minor thing, but then those products would get burnt as well. So, um, no, Diels-Alder is going to be more for making highly structured molecules. Um, with like pharmaceuticals being the prime example. There we go. Uh, so yeah, I'm not going to worry about this. Uh, it's used in, I, I think it is. I do think it is. So what do these guys mean? Um, well, this antirafacial essentially means that um, your second molecule has to be twisted somehow so that on one end of your first molecule it attaches to the top and on the other end it attaches to the bottom. Uh, that's kind of hard for a lot of reactions to do. Okay. Uh, superfacial means that the second molecule has to come in and it makes uh, bonds from uh, the same face, from the, from the same side. Right. So um, having things make bonds from the same side versus opposite sides is much is, is much easier. So Diels Alder reactions do this superfacial type of thing. I think you can see if um, if we have um, if we have, um, the ability to have molecules um, react so that you form um, new carbon-carbon bonds and they both have to point in the same direction. That actually starts to give you control over the reaction and um, what products are made. Oops. There we go. Um, more jargon. Exo versus endo. All this means is... Um, how does the second molecule, this guy, for example, how does that come in relative to the first? Notice how it's O double bond C, C double bond C. And so in this case, we've got the double bond that's actually making the diels alder reaction happen. And then there's this other thing. Well, here it's on the top, there it's on the bottom. So, oh, thank you, games. Yes, perfect. Um, so basically, there's, um, you know, one, th this is one face that's um, reacting with the thing on the top. That's the other face. Uh, how the faces react, it kind of depends on what's attached, right? So endo versus exo. Endo is the one that usually happens. To forms faster. This extra little bit of interaction helps it to form faster and makes the product faster. Even though it's more congested overall to give in the products, and I can show you an example of that over here. Uh, move this guy over here. Move it up.
So uh, this is, let's see, I meant to have the um, bonds in red in both molecules. Those are the new bonds that form um, from uh, pretty much the reaction shown on uh, the slide, very similar. Um, but one's an exo, one's an endo. Um, the back of the molecules are in exactly the same orientation, but you can see the front one points uh, left, one points right. Uh, and, you know, if you look at them from the top, one's a little more flattened out, one's a little more congested. They're different molecules. Um, they have the same connectivity, right? Each atom is connected to its neighbor in the same way, but because of the left-handed stuff and the right-handed stuff, the um, overall geometry is different, right? So uh, one of these is exo, it's the one on the uh, right, uh, one of them is uh, endo. The exo one would be the one that would tend to form um, all other things being equal. Okay, so basically that's uh, that's how, how the visualization goes. So there's this molecule on the um, left plus the one on the middle. Um, I've made them parts of rings so that uh, endo and exo actually um, does matter in, in this particular case. Okay? But it's still a diene because it's got two of these double bonds. The ene, -E, when it's part of a molecule, mean there's a double bond in there somewhere. Maybe I'll do a different talk on nomenclature and how to name things. Yeah, yeah okay, so um, there was also conrotatory and disrotatory. I'll just mention that really, really briefly. This is a molecule with a double bond, a single bond, and a double bond. And what you can do is shine light on it. And um, this carbon will rotate clockwise, this one will rotate counterclockwise. I'm sorry, it's drawn so that this one rotates clockwise, that one rotates counterclockwise. Yes, I said that right. No, they're both going clockwise. Duh. That way you get the lobes of the same shading um, coming towards each other, forming a bond. Uh, and then you have a bond. But, you know, if you had a methyl group there and a methyl group there, you start with everything in the same plane, but you end up with one methyl group up, one methyl group down. Okay? Um, if you have a different number of double bonds involved, you can have a reaction where these guys have to rotate in opposite directions. That's the disrotatory to make that bond. Okay, so um, these, these rules, these um, considerations of what colors the lobes are, essentially, um, give us control over structure. So, so yeah, I mean, there's just a couple of points here. Um, mo a lot of the times these things all happen up at the same time, but you could have one side connect uh, earlier than the than the other. It could go click click. Um, Lewis acids. I'm probably um, going over with my time, so I think I'll um, not inflict that on you right now. Uh, one nice point here is that these reactions are reversible. Um, you know, you can. Um, heat these molecules up after the diels alzer reaction to make them, make them go back to their starting material. That's particularly useful if uh, you want the uh, diels alzer starting materials, but uh, there's no real good way of making them. Maybe what you can do is um, get the particular pr like product um, that you would get from the diels alzer reaction. Maybe you can make it a different way. Uh, and if so, heat the bejesus out of it and um, 
you know, basically get back to uh, starting materials that you want. Not a particularly efficient way of doing things, but uh, sometimes they are useful. Let's see. Let's see, I've got one little model of a transition metal complex. And I'll show you here in a minute. I'll move this out to the front. PhDs in transition metal or metallic chemistry, um, which basically means we do organic chemistry uh, and uh, pop it onto transition metals. The brown atom is my point. Move this out. It's not the most efficient. Got it. Is an iron. Ah, don't have it. But I'm close. There we go. The brown atom is an iron atom. And it happens to be connected to, uh, looks like a six-membered ring. That would be what's uh, up and down vertically on uh, your right. Uh, it's actually connected to four of those carbons. You can see four lines there. Um, it would be that would be a diene. Um, the iron being connected in that way masks the diene. And so what we could do is um, maybe a reaction that might give you a diels alder reaction if the iron weren't around. But uh, this ends up being a masked diene. So that's a useful. Um, role of transition metal chemistry, we can uh, reverse some of the chemical reactivity of uh, certain molecules. Let's see. Maybe there's more than one of them. Okay. But again, having metals in your pharmaceuticals is not good. That brings me back to uh, Macmillan's work. Basically, found ways, found a way to um, make this diels alder reaction. You see your double bond, you see the pair of double bonds. He made this reaction go um, faster, and he made it go to one of these products, uh, I think about 97% yield, maybe 3% yield of the other one. Um, and he did it without a metal. Um, this catalyst, this thing, if he didn't have it there, the reaction would probably not go very well and maybe give a 50-50 mixture or something like that. Uh, I got it to go in a 90s, I think it was, I've got it on the slide, 97 to 3 or something like that. How? Well, that's a good question. Let's answer that. So, Essentially, this is from the original paper. I shamelessly stole uh, the picture. Uh, essentially, um, this catalyst, that NH group, can end up where that oxygen is. Okay, so this isn't exactly this. This isn't exactly the same molecule as an intermediate. The only difference is um, this benzene ring over here has been replaced by a hydrogen in the molecule they chose to draw. But essentially, uh, this set of atoms corresponds to that starting material. Uh, the rest of it is where that NH is attached. And the beautiful thing you can see is that there's this huge group on this side that's going to block the second molecule from coming in and make it so that only one face of this guy can react. Right? And that's where that's where our like 97% yield comes in. Um, this is this is how you would have to explain 
what's going on if you were to um, take an organic chemistry course and write an exam on it. Uh, essentially, um, you know, you could go through a step-by-step -step analysis and you see that C double bond O is a place where that nitrogen can interact. And then there's a series of logical steps that uh, uh, you can spit out water and end up having that carbon, which is that carbon, those two are the same carbon, um, ending up being attached to that uh, nitrogen. Let's see. Shiloh is asking, when this process is used to artificially produce something like vitamin D or vitamin, like what occurs when the vitamin reaches, passes its expiration dates? Uh, are the hydrogen bonds breaking down naturally or even in the medicine? Okay, so this is a great question because double bonds, uh, and vitamin D is a great example of that because it's got a lot of these double bonds. It's got this arrangement, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond. Um, those arrangements are subject to oxidation. So essentially, um, very, very slowly this happens, so it's got a shelf life, but essentially um, what can happen is that you get a um, one of those double bonds reacting with oxygen to give you a peroxide. And then that starts to um, make links with adjacent molecules double bonds. It ends up being a chain process. Um, and it's the process of going rancid, essentially. So, um, you know, after its exp expiration date, uh, they're pretty conservative with the expiration dates. Um, but, you know, after the expiration dates, you probably got a bit of rancidity happening. So, yeah, basically, it's changing the structures. So, essentially, uh, on this slide, I've just kind of shown how those, um, how the catalyst gets on the um, species of interest. And all of these reactions are reversible. So once the catalyst gets on and makes the thing that actually does the reaction, it can come off again in, in the same way as it gone on, just a reverse order. So let's see. What I've circled there is uh, carbon atom that's got four different things attached. It's got a handedness. The two starting materials did not have any handedness to them. So that carbon I've circled is going to imprint its handedness on the reaction product, right? Because this, this side um, is blocked. You might get the opposite reaction product if you swapped those two groups. And that's how a lot of these reactions work. I guess you get 94% uh, of the one product and then 6% uh, of the other. That's still great for the very first reaction um, published um, with this purely organic catalysis. Let's go back for a second. I've got a thing to say, though. Um, this particular uh, catalysis will only work, <coughs> excuse me, if you have that C double bond O in the starting material to begin with. There we go. So if you have this part of the molecule, that catalyst will work. If you don't, if you have something else there instead, that catalyst won't do the same thing. So uh, Macmillan's work is, uh, is really nice in that it shows that this catalysis is possible. Um, but uh, you have to tune your catalyst for the reaction that you want to do. So it's not something where you can just have, you know, like in the transition metal catalyst, the ruthenium stuff, you just have it on the shelf, you just throw it in, see what happens, and it's likely to work. Uh, you actually have to do a lot more thought and design to make a particular reaction go uh, for, for, for these methods. Okay. All right, so that's bringing me to the end. Sorry for going a little bit late here. Um, 
you know, it's very flexible and we get metal free pathways to uh, good, good chemicals, fine chemicals as they're, as they're called. Um, um, thanks, thanks Orange for coming. Um, and, uh, you know, basically I'm wrapping up here. Uh, each reaction I said, uh, you need to design its catalysts. Uh, and this is a uh, active topic of research. I mean, very, very uh, lot, lots and lots of uh, papers. This has been exponentially growing since its discovery um, 20 years ago. Okay, so with that, uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming and for having patience with me while I'm talking about chemistry. Sorry if I'm um, scaring you with the organic stuff. Um, I really appreciate um, you coming. Um, you know, basically, also thanks to NSF that uh, supports um, the uh, Science Circle and uh, supports uh, my research. Um, my research students, I um, am happy with. Uh, they they. Uh, they help a lot behind the scenes for um, different things that we've done. Uh, Dr. Richter Addy, who's my collaborator on uh, the grant, uh, yeah, I owe him so, so much. Uh, and of course, um, you know, my own school, um, you know, department, college, graduate school, all of those things, and definitely you for your attention. Thank you so much. Let's see, and I'm, I'm happy answering some questions if anyone's got questions. All right. All righty. Well, thank you so much. Uh, have a great evening, everybody. I'll wrap up and make sure that I uh, remove my objects. Those cats got the catalyst. They settled down. Now they're running around, kind of fending them off for a little while from the keyboard. Only during talks or Zoom meetings um, do they. except for the slide projector, our slide show. Oops. I'll make sure my molecule pet when I go away doesn't 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 uh, go anywhere.